Uh, the reason I love Walter Bond's speech so much is because his enthusiasm was so infectious. I mean, uh, sales is a transfer of emotion, a transfer of energy, and that's what we really felt from his presentation. He's a fantastic speaker. We've had big audiences and small audiences. He's done an, an 11 city tour over two weeks. And uh, what he was really able to do was connect with the client. Thank you, Walter Bond. You are amazing. And I'm waiting in line to get your book and your CD signed. So I'm super excited to be here. He was probably just the best motivational speaker I've ever heard before. He was really good. Cool. I have a tremendous amount of respect because he did what business owners do. He didn't get this thing kind of uh, handed to him. Walter Bond is teaching you how to build a business or have a great life because he started from scratch himself. All right. Good morning. Uh, today we're here with Walter Bond. Walter has written one of the top business books of 2019 and 2020 called Swim, which is awesome. How a shark and a parasite teach you leadership, mentoring and next level success. He's also one of the top speakers in the world. And uh, trust me, if you haven't been on his YouTube page yet, uh, you, you got to go there. Uh, it'll make the day and make things a lot easier for you and give you a little bit of motivation. Walter's also a former uh, professional basketball player in the NBA, uh, and today we're going to talk about his book uh, and motivation. So welcome. I appreciate oh, it. Thank you, Ryan. I'm excited. Could you could you take us back um, when you were growing up? Did was it always a goal to be a, a basketball player, a professional basketball player? You know, great question. Actually, the goal was to be a pro athlete, and I was really good in baseball. Uh, football, basketball, and in fact, sometimes when I when I connect with someone who knew me, you know, from Chicago, they would say, you know, you should have played baseball. I was named after my uncle who played Major League Baseball, so I'm really I'm really from a baseball family at the core. But when you grow up in Chicago, you know, basketball kind of runs Chicago. So if I grew up in Pennsylvania, I probably would have been a football player. If I grew up in Texas, who knows what I would have been, you know. But uh, basketball kind of ran Chicago, and those were my best opportunities. So my, my goal was to be a pro athlete when I was younger. Did you, uh, nowadays, they, uh, kids kind of specialize in one sport that they don't really play a lot of different sports all throughout the year anymore, like I did. Um, were you, did you play everything throughout the year or did you did you kind of realize that hey basketball is it i'm just gonna i'm gonna focus on that you know another great question um i played everything you know you played what was in season and if muhammad ali was fighting you you wouldn't find you some socks and pretended like you were a boxer you know <laughs> uh but you know i am tell you a funny story i was player of the game when i played for the mavericks and the announcer asked me you know how did I develop my left hand? He just went on and on how good my left hand was. And I was stumped. I was like, I don't do anything extra with my left hand. So how is my left hand so developed? And then I remembered baseball. You know, I was a back catcher. And so when you play baseball, you're basically ambidextrous. You know, you use your left hand as much as your right hand. And um, I know a lot of uh, football coaches that only recruit defensive backs who played basketball. Right. So I think that it's important to cross train, you know, to play different sports because you work on different muscle groups, you work on different phases. And I think that it develops a better overall athlete. So if I don't play baseball, my left hand is not as developed. And if my left hand is not as developed, I might not have played in the NBA. Wow. So I credit a lot of my NBA career to playing baseball. Wow. So you, you went undrafted. So how, could you tell me um, how that process went and how did you, how did you just stick with it and, and uh, I mean, become an NBA basketball player, which is just an incredible uh, feat? Well, you know, before that, I didn't start in college. I came off the bench. So to come off the bench in college and to get drafted is not realistic. So one thing I did do right is that every year I was voted most improved player. You know, that's the only trophy I wanted. A coach would have a banquet at the end of the year at the University of Minnesota, and they would name the most improved player. And I pretty much won it every year. And by winning most improved player every year, 
I got significantly better every year. And in four years, I turned into an NBA prospect. But I still had to get better when I left college. I played in the CBA for one year. I played in the, on a team called the Wichita Falls Texans. It was a minor league basketball team, you know, no different than the D League or the G League, or whatever they call it today. And I made the all rookie team, and then I made it to the uh, NBA. So, you know, I'm the, I'm the story. I'm the poster child of hard work, continuous improvement, and just getting better. You know, some people just think they're born successful or not. Like, no, you gotta, you, you're born with a particular gift or talent, but then you got to work and develop your talent. And if you don't get better, you know, it's hard to really reach your goals and live your dreams. Did you, did you have a backup plan at that point or were you just totally focused on this is my goal to, to be a professional uh, basketball player? Well, you know, my parents were teachers and so I graduated. I had my degree and I got offered a job to become a hospital administrator. It was a $75,000 job in 1991. Wow. And so um, I was about to take the job, and my dad asked me a question. Because my senior year, I broke my foot twice. And so from my mind and my lens, I was like, look, I didn't start in college. I have seven points a game. You got a $75,000 job. Hey, <laughs> take it and run. You know, you played Division One basketball. Hey, it's okay. You, you gave it a good run. Move on. And my old man was like, do you think you're good enough to play in the NBA? And I was like, Dad, I didn't start in college. And I had all these reasons to justify not trying. And he finally asked me, what do you have to lose? Like, you don't want to live life with regrets. And I was a preseason All-Big Ten selection my senior year, even though I didn't start the first three. And so my old man was kind of like, look, if you would have stayed healthy, we don't know what would have happened. You know, and if you think you're good enough, go for it. If you can find one job, at 75,000, trust me, you can find another one. Wow. He's right. You know, he's right. And um, I went for it, and um, I made it, you know. And I settled back into work after my eight-year career was over, but it created a platform. It created an experience. It, incre it, it created incredible revenue. I traveled the world. I lived in Italy, Greece, Germany, Venezuela, and I broadcasted for the Timberwolves. I had an incredible experience in the industry called basketball for 10 years. And then I started working, right, like a real job. And um, so I teach people, man, go for it. You know, I mean, you want to be realistic. You want to have a, you know, a good shot. But just go for it. Were there were there players or coaches or, or obviously your dad who, who really – stick in your mind who who just uh, you looked up to and kind of mentored you throughout that process it, as far as the NBA and basketball? Yes. You know, my, my, my college coaches at the University of Minnesota, uh, Clem Haskins, our head coach, was incredible with player development. Um, his players always played hard. His players always got better. And the NBA liked his players for that reason. We were always physical, mentally tough, and we got better. And he had really good assistant coaches. You know, you're in Penn State territory, right? Yep. You know, to have a really good program, the fans focus on the head coach. But most of the coaching is done by the assistant coaches. You know, they're the ones who will roll up their sleeve and rebound for you or wake up early in the morning and do drills with you or sit down and talk to you. I remember my college assistant coach, a guy named Al Brown, and I played a little college baseball. And he came, he came and saw me play. And he says, Walter, I, you got a dilemma. You're a really good baseball player. You know, I just watch you play. Like, you're strong. You got a great arm. You got good hand-eye coordination. And obviously, I think the world of you as a basketball player. You have a tough dilemma, but can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, coach. Do you want to be a pro? You're really good in baseball. You're really good in basketball. But do you want to be a pro? And that was a fantastic question, man. And I thought about it, and I was like, yes, of course. He said, well, if you want to be a pro, you got to choose one. And I'm not going to tell you which one. If you want to be a pro, you got to choose one. 
And ironically, during my basketball career, I did a private workout with the Minnesota Twin. And a scout was like, how old are you? And I was 21. And he was like, man, if you were 19, we'd do something. And, you know, giving up baseball was a tough decision. But it really taught me that we got to get focused. There's so many people in life want to walk up to me and hand me three business cards. You know, right then I know you're not focused. Right? You know, even Michael Jordan tried to play baseball. Epic fail. No matter how talented he was, he didn't have enough time to develop into a major league baseball player at 31, 32, whenever he tried. You got time to focus on one thing. And if you choose the right thing, being focused on one thing, like LeBron, is brilliant because you can make so much money that you, you don't even need a second thing. But, you know, we got people, and I almost did it, so I'm not being critical or judgmental. I get it. People are gifted. They're talented. They can do multiple things. But if you want to be a pro, if you want to reach the top and be a pinnacle player, you got to choose one thing and get ultra-focused on that one thing. I learned that, and from that conversation with my coach, the assistant coach, I was in the NBA about two years later. I stopped playing baseball, and I was, you know, dividing my time, and I totally sold out to basketball, and my improvement even expedited even more by just doing one thing. And that's why I teach the power of focus, man. So many people out here are distracted. You're focused on your career. You're focused on your role. You're focused on your one opportunity and go to work and become an impact player. And over time, you'll get exactly what you think you deserve out of life. But as long as we're distracted, you know, we always have the woulda, coulda, shoulda, shoulda kind of mentality. Were there were there players um, at your time when you were playing with them who had just had so much talent uh, but just didn't put the work in, and, and then on the other end of that, who maybe didn't have all the talent, but just worked, worked like heck, and um, just became better players than those those guys with all the talent. You know, another great question, Ryan. You know, in the book Swim, we talk about the sacred six, and one of the characteristics of a shark who runs the ocean, right? If you go to the beach and let your kids go swimming. There's only one fish you worry about. It's a shark. Sharks run the ocean. The sharks never stop moving. They're in constant motion. And I equate that to work ethic, right? You know, we just honored Kobe Bryant. His work ethic was unparalleled. Michael Jordan, unparalleled work ethic. But you know what? Jersey Mike Subs is a big client. Their founder, Peter Cancro, work ethic. Shark never stops moving, right? And so... At the college level, all my teammates were talented, right? All of them were studs wherever they came from, whether it was North Carolina, the Bahamas. I, mean, I, had, I had teammates from all over the country, Denver. You know, everybody was a stud when they showed up in college. But then when you got on the college campus, there was this new pecking order created. And the guys who stayed confident and kept working, you know, kind of, stayed on top of the pecking order. The guys who lost their confidence and or stopped working, you know, kind of became regular students and eventually, you know, basketball ended. And um, I had one teammate who was a lottery pick with the Miami Heat, and he was a worker. I mean, his name was Willie Burton. He was the most talented teammate I ever had. But then he got derailed by anxiety and depression and, um, you know, some mental health issues. I mean, the good news is now he's healthy. Um, he's teaching. He works in Detroit in the school district. He's the athletic director. And so even he got back on his feet, right? But talent is not enough. You need to be talented. But you also got to work hard. You also got to keep your mind right. <laughs> you, know? you know, here's a guy who scored 53 in the game, wow. right? He had 53 in the NBA the most talented teammate I ever had. But he didn't have that career just because his mind wasn't right. But now he's able to really be an impact player for kids. Uh, he's healthy. He's happy. 
Uh, we just retired, retired his jersey. And he was a hard worker. I mean, he worked hard. It wasn't a work ethic, but just his mind was just always busy and racing and cluttered and cloudy. And his mental health was not healthy. And mm. because of that, not talent, not work ethic, because of his mindset, um, that's why I talk a lot about mindset. And that's why I talk about the shark mindset, right? Sharks only look up, they never look down, which means sharks are very positive and they don't deal with petty stuff. You know, we live in a world that people are negative, critical, and deal with petty stuff. You know, my parents were abusive or, you know, my dad wasn't around. You know what? And nobody's got this thing perfect, right? Everybody got some challenges, but you can't let your past cripple your future. You know, nobody's perfect. And that's not an excuse, you know, for us to stop moving forward. And I see time and time again, you know, people allow incidents in the past, this one incident, cripple them for, for life. You know, this happened to me and now I feel vulnerable. Like, dude, never stop moving. Okay. Only look up, never look down. I broke my foot twice my senior year. It became my biggest blessing. Now as a motivational speaker, I got a story. You know, people are like, how'd you make it to the NBA? You didn't start in college and you still made it to the NBA? How? So my setbacks are now a part of my testimony. And I thank God that I went through these challenges and now people listen because I got the credibility that I achieved something incredible despite challenges, despite setbacks. And that's why we got to fight through our little imperfect lives because we still can be successful despite them. So what do you do? You, I'm going to skip around because you just brought up a good point. Um, you, you're a professional athlete. Um, you're getting yelled at in the stands. People are calling you, you know, every name in the book. Um, there's a lot of pressure. Same as in business. Um, you're getting, there's a lot of pressure. You might get crazy comments on social media. How, how does how does somebody uh, deflect all of that and still move forward? You know, support, support. You know, a lot of times people don't understand pro athletes and the posse. You know, that's support. That's a support network. I mean, if you really think about it, and I talk about this all the time with my business leaders in a very emotional way. Tiger Woods was the greatest golfer in the world who fell apart when his dad died. You know, the golfing community, they want to talk about his knee, they want to talk about his back. No, man. Tiger Woods has not been the same since his father died, which means he lost his support. Now, who does Tiger Woods call and confide in? Who's not going to write a tell-all book? He's not going to tweet about it. He's not going to, you know, go behind his back and try and get a book deal. You know, let's talk about Michael Jordan. You know, Michael Jordan started playing baseball after his dad died. You know, so my whole point is we all need support. And that's why we talk about the shark and the sucker fish. The shark and the sucker fish. That's why the book is so dynamic. When I got the idea of the book from a fishing trip, my light clicked on and realized this is how I made it to the NBA. I had support. This is how I became a Hall of Fame speaker. I had coaches and mentors along the way. You know, people want to talk about Walter Bond and all the cool things that I achieved. But the real secret is, guys, I had coaching. I had mentors. I had support. So, yeah, I got here. But, hell, I had help along the way. You know, I had a head coach in basketball who taught me player development and getting better. I had an assistant coach who taught me to focus. Right. I had a father who was also my high school principal. Right. If I look at my life, I had this incredible support network that helped me get through the heckling fans. Right. Who are sensitive and really ignorant. Right. Who don't who, who think these athletes are robots. You know, how would you like somebody to come to your job and yell at you all day? I mean, come on. Think about it. <laughs> Just yell at you all day at your job. You would be annoyed. You would be like, why, why are you messing with me, dude? Let me do my job. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, people don't even think that way. They just think that pro athletes are this different caliber of, of, of humanity. 
and I could talk about them. I could criticize them. And some fans take real shots. I mean, some fans, I saw a tweet that I thought was grievous after Kobe died. Someone tweeted, I wish it was LeBron on the, on the helicopter. I mean, how wicked can you be? I mean, mm-hmm. how nasty can you be to another human? But the average fan don't even see it that way. They don't see LeBron or Jay-Z or Beyonce or, 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 or you know, they don't see them as a human. You know, they see them as some alien being that I can say and do whatever I want to them and it's not going to have an impact or have consequences. Man, I remember being a fan. I could hear the fans echo. You could hear them, okay? I have good hearing. I can hear you, right? And if I'm not buttoned up tight, I don't have that support network at home, right? If I'm a little stressed out, if I have some anxiety, it can affect us. You know, uh, the NBA is a client. And we were doing programs for the NBA rookies. And a psychologist comes out. And she says, how are you guys handling stress? You know, all the guys are like, what are you talking about? We're in the league. Like, what? We're on top of the world. And she was like, all of you guys are stressed out. And you don't even realize it. And literally, I was in the back of the room, 50 years old, former NBA ball player. And I was like, where is she going with this? And then she broke it down. She was like, why do you think you guys have so much sex? That's stress. That's a coping mechanism. Why do you guys smoke so much marijuana? That's a coping mechanism. Why do you guys drink so much? That's a coping mechanism. And by the time she got done with us, I was like, oh my goodness. When I was in college, I thought I was just living the college life when all of my behavior was all created by managing stress. You got college athletes breaking down, doing dumb stuff, crazy stuff, wild stuff, weird stuff. And a lot of it has to do with stress, playing in front of 100,000, being a top recruit, your mom hoping you make it to the NFL because they live in the projects or trailer home, right? The pressure and expectation of being successful in every game and not failing. And she broke it down. And it was to the point where we all looked at each other like, man, we all need therapists, dude. We all need somebody. To, and I was 50 years old in the room, former player. You know, I'm a motivational speaker. I speak in front of 25,000. How do I manage that stress? Right? The client hoping and believing that I'm going to say something that's going to turn their sales force around. It's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of stress. Right now, L.A. is hoping that LeBron can deliver a championship, you know, to redeem Kobe and, and, and do it for Kobe. That's stress. That's stress, okay? And how does a human carry the weight of the stress? And you have people every day who just have normal jobs dealing with anxiety and depression. And you have no idea what it's like to sing like J-Lo at halftime of the Super Bowl, <laughs> right? And then you want to go out and heckle them. Come on. Come and, on. And, and I saw a lot of comments about her performance, um, a lot of uh, nasty, just just deep down to the core, nasty comments about that. It's, that's tough. Um, and she's you know, with eight. Social media, you know, Ryan, let's be honest. Social media is amazing. It's given a lot of people an opportunity to have a voice. And a lot of people have taken advantage of that platform to be positive and uplifting and do podcasts and do a lot of cool stuff. But others, unfortunately, have used the same platform, the same opportunity to be destructive, to be vile, to be, to be nasty. And so it's not social media that's bad. It's not the internet that's bad. It's the way people use it. I use the internet. I use social media to build people up and encourage people. And here's the crazy part. I get to make money doing it. Right? So there's some financial benefit to being positive. Most people on the social media networks who have been critical and vile and negative, they're tearing down humanity and they don't even get to make money by doing it. Be positive, right? It's very lucrative. Think about that. 
Yeah. It's positive. It's lucrative to be positive. It is very detrimental to be negative, right? Choose life is basically, you know, my, my, my overarching message. When, when, when basketball was over, was it a definitive end or did, did you keep, did you keep trying for a little bit or did you just know that it was, that was it? Well, you know, I, I went over to Europe and so when the NBA ended, I kept trying for the NBA but at some point, you got to make money because your career is a window that you have to really profit from. Um, so I went over to Italy, Greece, Germany, and um, played pro ball in Europe. Made great money. Um, still had hopes of playing in the NBA. In fact, I came back from Germany my last year, and uh, the Utah Jazz were interested. And at the last minute, they chose another guy, and um, I retired right then. I'm like, I'm done. You know, my goal was to play in the NBA. My goal was not to play in Europe. And remember, I turned down a $75,000 job. <laughs> and I remember my dad saying, you know what? If you can find one $75,000 job, you can find another one. Right? So when my career ended, Ryan, I attacked the business world. And I realized that being an entrepreneur was the route I wanted to go. And we launched a uh, training and development company. And 19 years later, I'm a Hall of Fame speaker. We got big casinos as clients. I sit on corporate boards. And it's been an amazing run. And um, I finally had to settle down into work and working real jobs. And But it was after a 10-year career, eight playing and two broadcasting in the industry of basketball. How did you make the jump to uh, to be a motivational speaker? When did you realize that that what you say um, so many people love? Well, again, I go back to my college basketball coach. When I left the University of Minnesota, you know, he planted the seed. He was like, you should be a motivational speaker. He's like, son, you could make a great living being a motivational speaker. So when my career ended 10 years later, I remember that conversation. So... You know, my college coaches impacted me in college. They impacted my pro basketball career. And they even impact me now. And it was my college basketball coach. His name's Clem Haskins. It was his idea. And I took him up on it 10 years later. And that's why when I see him, man, I get emotional. Because I'm like, dude, you have no idea what kind of impact you had on my life. You know, we're not even talking about my parents, right? My parents were amazing. But my college basketball coach developed me into an NBA ball player and also gave me an idea on a career that has been incredibly lucrative, right? So, I mean, you're talking about an impact player in my life. You don't want to talk about a shark and a sucker fish. You know, he's my shark, and I was his sucker fish. And if you don't understand that, you got to read the book Swim. But, again, it goes back to having great coaches, great mentors, and having support, right? Everybody got a dream. But most people try and go about it themselves. Like, no, you need support. Get a coach. Get a mentor. Get somebody that can help you get there that's been there themselves. And the likelihood of you being successful is that much greater by having great coaches, mentors, and support. Do you remember the first, I'm sure you do, do you remember the first time that you, you stood up in front of a, an audience? The very first time. It was a couple of first times. Um, wow. My first corporate event was in front of a construction company. Uh, they built the Metrodome in Minneapolis. It was called Canutes and Construction. Um, during my basketball career, I spoke in front of 10,000 one day. Uh, I was playing for the Yakima Sun Kings in the CBA, and um, I got a chance to speak to the to the crowd. And ten minutes later, people were like, "Dude, you're good, right?" And it's, it's really just a gift that um, God gave me. But um, I really started in high schools and middle schools, you know, and then we kind of pro progressed to corporate America. So there's wow. a bunch of first, you know. I can't really think about the very first time I got in front of people because uh, in college we went around a lot to churches and middle schools high schools and I became the unofficial spokesman for the team and that's where my coach kind of got that idea 
Hmm. So when I, um, like I said earlier, if you haven't checked out uh, Walter's uh, YouTube page, you should. When I um, scheduled this, I, my son works with me and he edits the videos and he just got out of college. When I showed him we were going to talk to you, Walter, he knew exactly who you were because he watched your videos while he was in college and it helped him out through a lot of stuff. So um, I just wanted to say I thank you for that. I appreciate that. Well, um, but that's what we do. We serve people. What What's the best thing about helping people to you? Just knowing it's the right thing. You know, I mean, to me, that's my purpose. I take joy in it. Um, serving mankind is, I think, what God wants us all to do. And I'm, I'm happiest when I'm serving. I'm miserable when I'm thinking about myself and focused on myself and focused on my issues. So think about what I just said. You know, we live in a world that's angry. We live in a world that's vile and vicious. And people are seeking happiness. I'm going to say it again. And hopefully people get the clue. I'm in my happiest when I'm serving others. Right? I'm most miserable when the focus is on me. Mm. Right? And if you go down Facebook, if you go down Instagram, if you go down and just search people's Twitter accounts, typically the focus is on them. Right? Rarely do you see people committing their whole social media profile to being a blessing to others. Right? And being positive to others. You know, those social media posters, they have a whole different energy, you know, and, and, and again, I'm at my happiest, you know, even as a speaker, you can get selfish, right? You can go up there and talk about yourself and how great you are. And, and if you were great like me, you would have a great life. But since you aren't great like me, your life sucks, right? You can get selfish. But when I get that microphone, I really want to bless that audience. I want to help that sales rep make more money. You know, I want to help that podcaster get a bigger audience. I want to help that CEO improve his or her culture. That's what they pay me to do. And that's what my focus is. How can I help them grow this business or whatever they hired me to do? And once I get to that mental place and really become a teammate, they say, look, I'm not here to just make money off of you. I'm here to really be your blessing. When I get into that mental space, dude, I'm like the top six men in the country. There's nobody better than America coming off your bench. And that's what companies do. They hire me to be their catalyst. And I come in and typically it, it transitions into um, a deeper relationship. We got a medical device company. We help them get to $100 million in their third wow. year. I did a monthly call for all their sales reps and all their sales managers. And so we had serious touch, serious impact on a medical device company that goes on to help people with hernias and people with burns and wounds, right? So I'm able to help people heal from a hernia better because I'm motivating a sales force to sell it better. You know, and just think about the impact that I can have, you know, in the world just by being a really good motivational speaker. That's awesome. So you, you, you said earlier that uh, you, you got the idea to write the book Swim on a fishing trip. Yes. How did that all come about? And uh, I mean, to sit down and just write a book is, is um, I would love to do that uh, one day. What you know, I've written three books and my, my, my first two books, I just mentally said, I need a book. So I sat down and manufactured a book. Swim is different. And I'm telling you, it was a bestseller in six months. Wow. This book was inspired by God. It was organic. I go fishing quite often here in Florida, and I take a captain, and the captain obviously drives the boat, but he's also a licensed fisherman who understands the ocean. So I, I catch this fish, and this fish is weak, frail. And I asked him, can we keep it? And he was like, no. And honestly, my thought was, how does this weak fish make it in the ocean? You know, Midwest guy, lake guy, you know, and I'm looking at this fish like this fish couldn't make it in a lake, let alone the ocean. And the captain says this. It's called a sucker fish. And he stuck it to the top of the boat and this fish has suctions on the top of his head. And it defied gravity for like five minutes. And he eventually threw it in the ocean. And I said, man, what is that? What kind of fish was that? 
He says, Walter, it's a sucker fish. And I was like, how does that weak fish make it in the ocean? That's what he said. He said, it flails around the ocean waiting for a shark to come by. And when a shark comes by, it uses its only resource, that's all it's got, <laughs> to connect to the shark. And when it connects to the shark, it works in tandem with the shark. Sharks need sucker fish. And sucker fish need shark. And Ryan, I dropped my fishing pole. And that's when I realized how I made it to the NBA. That's how I realized I how I became a Hall of Fame speaker. For a long time in my life, I was a sucker fish waiting for a shark to come back. Right? And by me connecting to my parents, by me connecting to my college basketball coach, by me connecting to my personal trainers, uh, my mentors as a motivational speaker, they taught me. And when you connect to a shark, the shark's job is to take you places you can't take yourself. And every time a shark makes a kill, the sucker fish gets to eat the scraps. But the sucker fish got one job to keep the shark clean. Parasites attack sharks. And so think about it. This big old great white shark runs the ocean, but they're still vulnerable. And they understand that they need teammates. They need teamwork. And when I got off that boat, we went and wrote the book Swim. And in six months, people are reading this book. And it's a parable. It's a story. And man, I got grown men calling me saying, I've never read a business book and was bawling when the book was over. And ultimately, I'm teaching people how to be a shark. Okay. And we do that through the sacred six. But more importantly, I teach my successful business people. You're not a real success in my book until you take somebody with you. And I have these grown men, in some cases millionaires, they look back over their career. They've made all this money, but they haven't helped one person. Mm. They haven't mentored one person. They haven't developed one person that can say, you know what, I mentored that, that kid, and now that kid is a president. I mentored that kid. Now that kid is the national sales director. I mentored that kid, and that kid is a VP of sales. And the conviction that these men feel, and women, at the end of their career, realizing that I've just been getting mad all these years, and I haven't helped one person get successful, instantly their whole paradigm changes, and their career focus changes. They realized through the book swim, I need to help others be successful because they realized they had mentors. <laughs> they realized they had coaches and the conviction of being so selfish is overwhelming to a lot of my readers and it inspires them to change and to become mentors and help others be successful. And that's what it's all about. I had coaches and mentors that helped me get to where I was. And so why would I not coach and mentor others? And so I'm on a mission, Ryan, to coach and mentor and inspire millions of people through our videos, through our book Swim, through my keynotes, through our trainings. We're going to take as many people as we can with us to their own personal levels of success. And this is just not just not for large companies. This is for, for, for small businesses, um, uh, medium-sized businesses as well? Man, this is for humanity. All right. The star of the book was a 17-year-old kid who went to a boys and girls club. And we wrote the book to impact youth because the star of the book got a mentor at 17. He went on to be wildly successful. And we also wrote it for the business community because a lot of times older people are like all oh, those young kids, those millennials, those Gen Xers. You know, all they want to do is play with their cell phone. And they get critical. Like, look, dude, don't you forget when you were 15, your mother said the same thing to you, right? And so, you know, I'm 50, right? So I'm a little bit of a tweener, right? I understand that old school mentality. But also understand that I was struggling not too long ago, right? I flunked out of my first high school, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't forget that. Yes, I'm wildly successful. Yes, people see me and say, dude, you're big time. Yeah, I get it. But not too long ago, I wasn't big time. Not, not too long ago, I was sitting on somebody's bench. 
not too long ago, I basically flunked out of a high school and had to switch schools. And at 50, I don't forget that. I don't forget my journey. I don't forget my failures. I don't forget what can happen for that C student, right? Think about that. High schools and colleges are loaded with free students. And they're just floating around just like that sucker fish. And they're waiting for that shark to come by. And when people see my videos on YouTube, I want to be your shark. <laughs> when people read my books, I want to be your shark. Because I had sharks in my life that took this sucker fish places I couldn't take myself. And as a result, I'm going to give back. And as a result, that's my message in life. That's my mission. I'm going to help as many people as I can. How, how can somebody young, uh, doesn't even have to be young, just, you know, lost, um, how do they find a mentor uh, that can help them? Is it somebody who just comes along in your life or, or are you searching for them? Well, both. You know, the best mentors are, are organic. You know, they just kind of happen naturally. But mentors are everywhere. I mean, I remember growing up, Ryan, a lot of kids in my neighborhood didn't have a dad like mine. And they would always be at my house. And at the time, I thought it was because I was so cool. And my <laughs> brother was so cool. The truth was, they would try to be around my dad. Right? And so just being in his presence, he wasn't their dad. But they began to see what a father does, how a father operates, how a father carries himself. Right? So sometimes it could be your friend's parents. You know, sometimes it could be a teacher at school. Sometimes it could be your football coach. It could be your first employer. You know, there's good people everywhere that love to be inspirations and love to mentor others. Boys and girls clubs, you know, they have mentorship programs. The YMCA, you know, it doesn't matter. There's places you can go to find mentor and find support. It's everywhere. Go to your church. I mean, literally, it's everywhere if you're looking for it. And if you understand how valuable it is. You know, there's an old saying, build it and they'll come, right? If you make a decision today, whoever's listening, that I need a mentor, right? Walter's right, great point. I'm out here by myself. I need a mentor. I promise you, your mentor will appear. Because that mentor has probably been there. <laughs> you just didn't realize that God had positioned them to be your mentor. And so now that you have this amazing revelation, go to that person, go to those people and ask them like, look, you know, I'm trying to be an athlete. Will you mentor me? I want to go to college. Will you mentor me? I want to be an entrepreneur. Will you mentor me? I want to be a CEO. Will you mentor me? Very few people say no to that mentorship request. It's so important because just yesterday, I'm, I'm, uh, it's amazing that you brought that up, is I, I was talking to somebody else about who, who do I have that I can really open up to and share everything to who's not really, uh, doesn't have another vested interest in, uh, uh, who, who won't judge me or um, just tell me everything that I want to hear, who can really just lay it down and say, hey, you know what, Ryan, you're really, you're messing up. You know, you're doing this wrong. We, we should, you know, let's go this way. So it's it, it's really important. It's tough to to go day by day and just hold all that stuff inside of you, like you said before. So uh, I would highly recommend uh, finding somebody that you can you can open up to. Definitely. You know, you know, one one of the catalysts of mental health is loneliness. You know, people don't realize that being lonely you know, can lead to mental health challenges. And we live in a world that, although there's people everywhere, a lot of people deal with loneliness because they never connect with anybody. You know, they never really connect in an intimate kind of way. You know, and basically I'm struggling. How can, how, I need help in this department. I need help in that department. And again, it goes back to Tiger Woods. You know, when he lost his dad, who does he connect to, to this day? in an intimate way. Like, man, this is my friend, okay? And I can talk to my friend in confidence, and my friend cares about me, and my friend isn't trying to get anything off of me other than just being a good friend, right? And, and sometimes your mentorship can happen with a peer, 
you know, there's peer-to-peer support and mentorship. So your mentor is not always somebody, you know, operating at a higher level. Those are important. A lot of mentorship can be done amongst your friends and through peer support. Um, could we talk about Kobe Bryant? Um, I mean, horrible news, obviously. Uh, what were what were your thoughts when when all this happened? You know, simply put, Ryan, you know, tragedy. I can't even think of another tragedy that parallels Kobe Bryant. You know, we. Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, Prince, you know, these guys and ladies were struggling with drugs. So it still was a shocker when they passed, but they they had gone down that route. And we learned in sixth grade, don't do drugs. Right? So if you commit to being a drug addict and doing drugs, that end is a strong possibility. Kobe was just a tragedy, right? That just came out of nowhere. It had nothing to do with any self-inflicted lifestyle wounds. It was just a a failure of a human being flying a helicopter that, you know, we make mistakes, you know. But the thing that I know about Kobe is that he was a hard worker. He was a shark who never stopped moving, right? And even when his career was over, he had developed this into such a better person. People don't realize that early in his career, he had a bad reputation for being a narcissist, for being antisocial, being a loner. And, you know, if you really think about Kobe, he was born and raised in Italy for, for the most part, you know? So he got to Italy when he was six. Language barrier. When you're six years old, you got to go to school. So here he is, this black kid, dumped into a classroom, who doesn't speak the language. So he had to work really hard to fit in in Italy. He lived there from 6 to 13, comes to America as a teenager, and he's basically a black Italian kid. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then he had to really work hard to fit in here. So I think he got a little bit of a bad reputation that he was a loner, aloof, uh, standoffish. I think he was probably a little socially awkward, right? But also a very confident basketball player, right? That's different. And it probably was was interpreted as arrogance, narcissism. And I just think he was just socially awkward. You know, the NBA is, uh, it's in, in a lot of cases, it's an urban game, it's an urban sport. So here he is, a black guy who's an Italian guy, came from an Italian culture. I lived in Italy and I understand the culture of, of Italy around a bunch of black guys, a bunch of Russians, who know who, (laughs) he probably was like, dude, like, I don't fit in anywhere I go. Like, I'm a unique oddball. And it probably was his mindset. And um, eventually, I think he developed his social skills. And I heard uh, Derek Fisher talk about it, his teammate, that when Kobe had a child, that's when Kobe changed. Mm. Right? And think about it. When before kids, it's about you. And the moment you have a child, you got to start taking care of somebody else. And you learn how to serve somebody else. And I think that really got Kobe out of the shell. And he had a bunch of girls. And girls are different than boys. Girls will talk to you. Girls are passionate. Girls get emotional. And having girls creates a different type of father-child dynamic than father-son. You know, sons are one word answers. How school? Fine. <laughs> what are you going to do when you get home? Nothing. You hungry? Yeah. You know, you ask girls how school 30 minutes later, you realize that, <laughs> you know, she had a project due and you got to help her. <laughs> you know, and girls are just totally different than guys. And I think Kobe being surrounded by four girls and a wife really pulled the best out of him to where not only did he develop as an amazing basketball player, he developed in a ve- into a very philanthropic, uh, sociable, likable, nice guy. So to me, he not only reached his potential as a, as a basketball player, he was reaching his potential as a person. And that's what I respected most about Kobe. 
Awesome. And that's the best way to remember somebody, not just watching their basketball highlights, but uh, hearing about uh, what they what they are about. Um, what are your goals for this year, personally? You know, I mean, 2019 was our best year ever. Uh, 2020 is off to an amazing start. Um, so my goals now are kind of shifting a little bit away from my personal success. I want to get in better shape. Um, I told my daughter the other day, I'm 51. Uh, my biggest regret is getting out of shape, you know, as a basketball player. I recently lost about 13 pounds. And 2020 for me is about continuing to impact people, but also take care of me better, you know, get in better shape, um, get more discipline, and get back to looking and feeling like an athlete again. You know, and I travel a lot, so I'm always on airplanes. I've always had these steak dinners with, with expensive wine and incredible food, incredible dessert. And it's no excuse. Hey, you know, I'm an athlete, right? I used to be very meticulous with my diet. I used to be very disciplined. And for whatever reason, I let go. And this year, my goal is to get my butt back into the athletic form. I want to become a 51-year-old athlete again. Awesome. He looks like a former NBA ball player and not a left tackle <laughs> for Penn State. <laughs> where, where I'm going to put all your links up here for everybody to see. I, I, I mean, I highly recommend them. Uh, if at least go to YouTube and watch some of these videos, and then it'll lead you to everywhere else. Where can we? Uh, where can everybody find your 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 book at? Um, yeah, a um, couple of places. One, you can text Shark to 66866 just text the word shark to 66866 you can go to our website walterbond.com um, we have tons of product on our website we have coaching programs we teach people how to build their own speaking business uh, we coach a lot of companies their leadership team their sales forces so walterbond.com is probably the best resource uh, a link to the book is walterbond.com backslash swim. You know, we got people who buy 30 at a time, 100 at a time, 200 at a time. Um, I met a guy who read my book. He says, man, I love your book so much. I just want to buy them and give them away. <laughs> like, just to random people. Like, And this guy was not a reader. And I knew he wasn't a reader. And I knew this book touched him. You know, we're in the human game, right? You know, and um, to me, anyone who wants to be more successful needs to really handle people better. Because I think we're all in the people business. There's basically three kinds of people. There's sharks, there's sucker fish, and there's parasites. And when you get that reading the book, you know that clearly. And the conviction, again, from a lot of people who read the book is that they've been taking and not giving. And that's what a parasite does. Think about it. A parasite latches on to you. They take your resources, but they never give back. And when people read the book and they start thinking, because one of the characters in the book was a parasite. And I wrote it in a way that you're going to identify with one of these characters. <laughs> and if you start identifying with that parasite, it is a horrible feeling. And it really inspires people to change and become more of a giver. And it really become more concerned about their fellow man and helping somebody else. And again, as I said earlier, that's the key to happiness. That's the key to prosperity. And I think that's what God wants. He wants us to be in service to mankind. And by doing that, that's how you get blessed. <laughs> right? If you really think about Jesus Christ, he was in the people business. That's the only business he was really in, if you really think about it. And I think if we all take that lesson and get into the people business, we'll prosper as well. Uh, Walter, I really appreciate it. I mean, I, 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 you're really helping people out, and hopefully um, uh, more people will see your message, definitely. So. Awesome. Shark, shark Mindset. Uh, we have a video called Shark Mindset. It has gone viral. I'm assuming that's what your son saw. Yeah. Uh, we had close to 3 million views and going. And once people get into our Shark Mindset world, they love our T-shirts. They love everything about the Shark Mindset, the book swim, the Sacred Six. You know, so just plug into us and we want to support you, whoever you are, 
to get to where you want to be. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Have a yes, blessed sir. day. Thank you.